What's up, guys? Welcome to Video CEO Podcast. We're here with Eamon. He's a 19-year-old making 90K per month in his agency. So Eamon, tell me, bro, how did you get started in the agency space? Yeah, good question. First and foremost, thanks for having me on. Of course, bro. So how I got started. Basically, I started video editing in 2014. So I was like nine or 10 years old. And then what happened was I was just editing video game clips and then I quit video games. So then I stopped editing as well. Mm. And then I got into the agency space because I was watching like Iman Gadzi, a couple other guys. And then eventually I found this one dude, his name was Daniel Fazio. Yeah. And then he made this YouTube video going over like the best type of agency to start. And he said, start a short form content agency. And I was like, oh, I know how to video edit. So I just quickly learned how to do ideas, how to do scripts. And then everything took off from there. So that was like November 25th, 2022. Fire, fire. So then when you first started, what what was the first thing you did in terms of starting the agency? Did you go into like learning how to get clients, um, learn how to edit better, you know, learn how to fulfill? Like what what did you start with? Yeah, good question. So the thing that I started with was just get my website done, get my VSL done. So that's a video sales letter goes on your website. And then after that, I got my goal was to just get that initial boring stuff out of the way. And then from there, I was simultaneously doing outreach while learning how to fulfill. So the thing that I was doing for outreach was sending free videos, right? So then what was happening is I was editing the videos and getting better, but I was also reaching out to clients. So I was kind of hitting two birds with one stone. And that's pretty much how I learned to fulfill and get clients. Got it. So how how did your outreach look in the beginning compared to now? Like what were you doing differently then to now? So I'm actually still doing the exact same client acquisition method. The only thing that changed, so, or nothing changed in my outreach, but what changed is I added inbound marketing. So now I'm still doing my dream 100 outreach. That's what I call it. So it's five DMs per day. I'm sending free work up front. But what I'm also doing is getting clients inbound. So that's through Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube mainly. Got it. Yeah. So then when you're doing this free work, run me through how that works. Is it just message them, hey, I love what you're doing. Send me some videos. We'll edit it for free. And then you just send it pretty much back to them. So what we're doing, so we mainly sell YouTube scripts or sorry, YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. And the free thing that I'm giving them up front is a YouTube script because I can't edit a whole YouTube video for them if I have yeah. no footage. So what we do is we say, hey, what's up name? And we personalize it. Because the thing is, we actually have to do research on the prospect in order to make the script in the first place. So it's super easy to personalize the first message. And then after that, we send the script, we send a personalized first line, and then we tell them, hey, if you record this video, we'll edit it for you for free as well, make the thumbnail and even schedule it. Mm. And then the prospect sees that and instantly I'm differentiated from the thousands of people reaching out to them. Well, not every day, but every month. And yeah, that's pretty much what we do. And what would you say is like your success rate with those like outreaches? Yeah. So when I had no case studies for every 100 people I would reach out to, I would close one to two prospects. And the thing is, you know, you don't close them instantly as you reach out to them. It takes time. Everyone has a conversion window. So that's what people don't understand. So not sure about you, but what I notice is it typically takes like 21 days to close someone from the first time you reach out. And yeah, but I'm curious with you because I know you're running yeah. outreach as well. Like- yeah. Um, so for us, our, our outreach, and again, we pretty much have kept it the same for, I want to say the last like two years. It's literally saying, hey, prospect, whatever the name is, um, I think you're leaving a lot of money on the table by doing this. Like, I think you should be doing X, Y, Z. And most of the time they're like, dude, I 100% agree with you. I believe we're leaving money on the table. How can you help us? Right. So that, that's kind of what we've done. Um, and again, we've seen same thing, probably, you know, obviously there's a bunch of point of contacts that you have to go through until they end up buying. Um, but for the most part, through like my stories and all that stuff, they eventually, you know, end up hitting us up and say, hey, let's let's do it. Um, OK, fire. So question. Obviously, you're super, super young. Um, probably a lot of people your age aren't doing what you're doing. What like motivates you at such a young age to pretty much pursue this? Yeah, good question. So what happened was I moved When I was 16 years old, I moved from Vancouver, Canada on the West Coast. I moved to Montreal, Canada. And then what happened was I was like separated from my friends. We had a really tight group. We were like 10 guys. And then when I moved away, it was like I was just chilling at home all the time or going on walks. I didn't really have too many friends. I had school friends. But the thing is, my school was like an hour and a half away. So I wouldn't hang out with them. So I was just on my phone. And at this point, I already tried drop shipping in 2020. So I was a little bit familiar with the online space. But then the real trigger for me was the first winter in Montreal. It was brutal. Like it was like minus 20. I was working at Costco at the time. And when I'd be walking home from from Costco, my eyelashes would freeze together Mm -hmm. because it was minus 20 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. So Costco freezing cold or sorry, it was freezing cold outside. 
And then I was like, okay, I need to get out of here. Right. And then I was scrolling through TikTok and I found this dude. His name was R Jack. Not too many people know about him. He was super good at going viral. And he would just talk about crazy ways to make money. He would talk about buying cars from Germany and flipping them in the States and how to get good credit, just random stuff. And just opened my eyes. I was like, okay, I don't have to go through this regular way to make money. Cause my whole life, I was just brainwashed by my parents. I love my parents, but I was brainwashed by them. They're like, oh, you know, get your degree and like buy real estate and, you know, be a lawyer or a doctor, that type of thing. So right away, I found this dude's TikToks and I was like, okay, I need to make money online or just a different way. So the winter plus finding someone on TikTok, like that triggered me. And then the final trigger was I I was always a straight A student, right? Like I got 99% in calculus one in college. And then I was doing a calculus two test that I studied like a week straight for super, super serious. I got the test and I didn't know anything, right? So I literally got the test, looked at it for three minutes, didn't know anything. I answered one question, gave it back, just left the class. Everyone was staring at me. And then right away I was like, okay, now I have to make money because I just failed this calculus two test. So that was the three triggers for me. That's fucking fire, bro. Um, so question, when was a moment where, um, you know, cause obviously, you know, when I first started my agency, it was like, okay, cool. This is something where I, I believe you can make money in it. But then there's a point where you're like, oh wait, no, you can make a lot of money doing this. So when was that point for you where, you know, you went from, okay, I can make some money from this. And then you were like, oh no, this is, I can make a lot of money. Yeah. I think going into it, I already knew I could make a ton of money, like right off the bat. I wasn't thinking small, like, oh, I want to make 5k a month or 10k a month. I saw the guys making 100, making 500K a month. So as soon as I went into it, I saw the potential. Got it. Yeah. So you aimed high right from the beginning. Yeah, pretty much. But I vlogged the entire time I was going from zero to 10K a month. So I would watch it back and then I would see my goals at the time. I would be like, oh, hopefully I get to 10K a month in six months. And the thing is I got to 10K a month in like two months. So it's cool to see like, you know, what I shot for and then how much faster I got it. So super grateful. So so actually, I would consider you a more of a high level kind of agency when you start to reach the 50 to 100K, that's pretty like high level. Um, what What do you think makes the difference between a high level agency or content agency and a low level, let's say 10 K a month. Like what's, what's the difference between both? Yeah. So the difference between a 10 K a month agency and let's say a 90 K a month agency is the guy at 10 K a month. He's pretty much running the show by himself and he maybe has like one or two video editors max. And that's the difference like with me. And I know yourself as well. Like I have 14 team members, you have 40. So that's the difference because when you, when you're running the show by yourself, you're splitting your focus between fulfillment, sales, marketing. So yeah. But how about you? What do you think? Um, I, yeah, I would say the same thing, bro. I would say the guy at 10 K is doing everything themselves. They're managing all the hats, right? They're doing the shooting. They're doing the editing. Some of them are even doing the posting. So in the very beginning in our agency, um, and I still can't believe I was doing this, but I was doing the posting for our clients. Yeah. So I, I would wake up basically in a rush, like, oh shit, I have to post for three, four five people go in there, have to download the video, create the caption, you know, do all these things. Um, you know, I didn't have any systems. I didn't have any processes. I didn't have any management admin team, nothing like that. So it's pretty much, you know, when you're on that 10 K a month, um, I think you just pretty much are doing everything yourself. Nothing's automated. Yep. Right? There's, there's no automation whatsoever. It, it's just pretty much all manually done compared to the 90 K to hundred K agencies were, you know, like I told you before the, uh, the podcast, everything is automated. Yep. There's not one thing that happens that doesn't get automated. Like if I go on my phone right now, I probably have 20 notifications of automations that of, you know, this person, this person upload this video, this person needs a revision, this person accept it, whatever it is. Um, even when videos get posted, right, we, we get automated or we get notified as well. Um, so I think those are the two uh, biggest things, but okay, cool. So for you, um, what were some, I guess, like pivotal things that you've learned on your journey that you wish you would have known when you first started? Yeah. I wish I knew when I first started that all it comes down to is number one, you need to know what to do. And then number two, just actually do it. But don't, what I'm trying to say is don't work like four hours a day or something. Like you should push like 12, 16 hours. And like I was doing that, like I was doing 12 hour days, 16 hour days, but sometimes I would just be doing the wrong things. So it's just as important to work a ton of hours, but also know what to do. So the way you do that is by educating yourself, you know, buying courses. Like I got started with a $50 a month course and a couple free YouTube videos. And then after I got some clients, then I started buying high ticket coaching programs. So always like, this is the main thing, like reinvesting into your education is massive. Yeah. How, how much you, How much would you say you've spent right now on like, you know, education? Yeah, I've spent... I looked at my my accounting stuff. So for 2023, I spent 
60K Canadian. So it's around like 40K USD. Wow. And then already this year so far, I've spent like 38K. So Okay. Like, and then yeah. in terms of education, what what type of education? Mentorship, courses, coaches, what, what yeah. type? So it's a mix. So there's about like three different types of tiers. You know, there's like a do-it-yourself info product that you can buy anywhere 50 bucks, maybe a thousand bucks. And then the next level after that is group coaching. So maybe you get an onboarding call, but then after that, it's just texting and then course access. And then the next level after that is like one-on-one -on -one coaching. So usually that's more because you're paying directly for the person's time. So I've got a mix of those three. I've always found that I get the most value from group coaching because I don't like phone calls that much. I don't know yeah. about you. I yeah. think that's a lot of entrepreneurs. So yeah. if I can just text someone, like I can get all the value I need. So yeah. Got it. Cool. And then for you, what, what's your like routine? Like, do you have a routine? Do you do anything specific when you wake up to when you go to bed? Like how, how does your day look like right now? Yeah, it's all over the place, to be honest. Like yeah. I'll go through phases where I'll be waking up at like 5 a.m. And then, you know, maybe I go gym at nine and then come back. Calls start at 11 a.m. But then I can only maintain that for so long before everything kind of crumbles down. And then I start waking up at like 10 a.m. But how the, the way I structure it is that I have all my calls from 11 a.m. up till 1 or 2 p.m. Eastern. And then I do deep work before that and then like deep work after that. And then that's, that's kind of how I manage it. Is, is that every single day or do you have specific days that you do that? Or is it every day? So it's every day, but the only difference is I don't take calls on Saturday and Sunday. I used to take calls seven days a week, but that's like, I'm so glad I switched to not taking calls on weekends because now I just have Saturday, Sunday, full day, no calls. Like I don't really see anyone. So I just lock in, make content, you know, write content. And yeah. How about you? How do you structure your day? Um, so same thing. So I, I actually recently just saw a video from Alex Ramos. I don't, I don't know if you've seen his video, the scheduling yeah, video. Um, so I actually made my schedule. It's up there. So I pretty much went with a lot of what he was doing in that video. I was doing very similar, but how I'm structured right now is I have my maker days where it's pretty much just days where I'm just making stuff that are going to push the business forward. And then I have my managing days where it's just, you know, admin work, uh, talking to the team, taking calls, things like that. Um, and that's worked really, really well because on my maker days, again, no, you know, at least for me, like if I have calls in between, I can't really focus yep. and get in that deep work. So if I have a full day of just making makers work, then I can get a lot further ahead than just kind of taking calls in between. Uh, so right now I do makers day pretty much Mondays. So like today, like we're filming uh, Mondays, Fridays, uh, Saturdays and Sundays are my maker days. And then Tuesdays uh, through Thursday is my managing day where I just like manage people. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. And so, if, yeah, go for it. Yeah. I was going to say with me, I would love to do it. Yeah. I would love to do that where I have my maker days and then, you know, the call days. But the problem with that that I see, and I'd love to hear what you think is, yeah. you know, you've got to be able to take sales calls at least five days a week because then yeah. if a prospect, you know, waits too long, they see, oh, they can't book for like three days, four days, et cetera. You know, they might go to someone else or something like that because yeah. I'm doing all the sales and marketing by myself. So, yeah. Yeah. What, so, what yeah. So for me, and I understand that. So the thing is, I mean, I, I know that I probably will lose clients if i don't take calls let's say mondays and fridays but again those days i'm doing so much things that really is pushing the business forward that that opportunity cost or that cost isn't really going to affect me um i think i'll get a lot further along if i can just either delay that call you know a day later um or again if they end up not just taking the call because it's too long then it, it is what it is so for me i think i, I rather prioritize the maker day so i can get just a lot further along uh, because then even if i have one or two calls that day it's it's pretty much messed up for the day mm -hmm. um so okay got it and in terms of do you have any like morning routines or anything that you do right now? No, nothing. It's literally, so right now I'm staying in Vancouver. So I'm in Pacific yeah. time, which is brutal. I hate it. Yeah. I feel sorry for anyone in Pacific time. So it's like my calls start at 9 a.m. Pacific. So usually I would literally wake up at like 8.30 a.m. Pacific. Yeah. I just pray real quick, then get right on the computer, do like quick 10, 20 minutes of work. And then after that, just calls. So, and even when I'm on Eastern time, it's like, I just wake up pray maybe eat something maybe not and then like get to work so there's no like, morning routine Fire. for you um when you first started um you know obviously in, you know i've dealt with this in the beginning where you charge a certain amount or you want to charge a certain amount where you feel scared or like hey that i think that price is too much right like 5k a month 10k a month um did you ever have that in the beginning and how did you get like over that yeah so the way i got over it was i started by charging like below what everyone else charged. So I asked people, I was like, hey, how much do you charge? They're like, oh, I charge 2K a month for 30 shorts or four YouTube videos, whatever it is. And then I undercut them. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna do it for 1500. Cause I know people are buying it at 2K, they're definitely gonna buy it at 1500. Cause there's a lot of people who buy on price. So, but that's typically like the lower level people of the market. The higher level people of the market, they don't 
buy on price. They want someone who actually knows what they're doing. Yeah. So I started at 1500 and then what I do is every one or two new clients I got, I bumped up the price anywhere from like 250 bucks a month to another 500 bucks a month. And then just kept going, kept going. And then eventually I'll hit a resistance level and then I'll bring it back down, stay there for a while, get more case studies, chill out for a couple months and then try again, bump it up and then it'll work. I'll bump it up and then I'll hit a resistance level. So that's kind of how I went about it. What, what was, um, I guess that resistance, resistance level for you? Yep. So what I found for me, the sweet spot is for my YouTube package, which is ideas, scripts, client records themselves. I don't do any shooting for any clients. And then we do all the post-production. So editing, thumbnail, SEO, posting for YouTube videos, 3,500 a month. That's been the sweet spot. I've sold it at 4k a month, a couple of times as well. And you know, it still works there. But that's the sweet spot that I found. Okay, got it. So you've never done anything higher than that, like 10K? Have you done any 10K retainers? Or, or so I've never done a 10K retainer. I got a couple 8K a month clients. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the max. So what? Um, so do you prefer those $3,500 retainers compared to like 8K retainers? Yeah, so the way I see it is investors prefer a business that has a lot more clients that are lower ticket because it's less risk, right? You know, oh, you churn one or two clients, it's not a big deal. Compared to you have clients paying you 10, 20K a month, you lose one that's 10% of your business. So definitely prefer the lower ticket guys. And then the other thing is like, when you have a 10K a month client, you have 10K a month problems, right? They'll be like messaging you, they're like, oh, I'm paying you 10K a month, you know, why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that? So it's a lot more, it just takes more bandwidth, yeah, right? Low ma uh, less maintenance. Yeah, exactly. But Got you it. have higher ticket people, right? Yeah, I have, uh, so our highest retainer right now is 10K. 10K? Okay. Yeah, so I've actually seen the opposite. So for us, our higher tier clients annoy us less or less maintenance, I would say, um, compared to some of our lower end clients. So I guess our 10K clients, um, from right now, from my experience, um, again, just very chill. Again, these are guys that are making anywhere from half a million to a million a month. So the 10K really isn't yep. like nothing to them. Um, so that's my experience, right? But again, maybe for you, it might be a little different. And I guess for your clients right now, like how do you, how do you retain your clients right now? Is it yeah. just through results or, or how's that? Yeah. Mainly through a combination of like fast turnaround times, constantly updating clients on the status of videos, and then just getting results. And also, so there's two things to getting your churn down. Number one is you want to actually try and become friends with your clients. That's one huge thing. Like Chris over here, he goes to dinners with his clients, all that stuff. I'm out in Canada. So my clients are usually in the States and I don't do that. But that's super good. Yeah. And then just the second thing is being super communicative. So texting them a lot, being super responsive. Like a lot of my clients are always like, wow, you text me back so fast. Like, I love it. The last thing they want is you know, to pay someone 10K a month or even 3,500 a month. And then they take one business day to answer them. So those are the two things. And then obviously third thing is get results. But yeah. All right. Question. How do you, how do you maintain, and obviously I'm assuming you're, you're doing a bunch of things, right? You're, you're taking sales calls, you're managing the team, you're, you know, you're doing, making sure the marketing team is doing, or the sales team is, or actually do you have a sales team or not? No, all Okay. Me. All you, all you. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, or do you have a lead gen team or anything like that? Nope. How's your team right now actually? So let me ask that. How, how's your structure of your team yep, right now? Sure thing. So basically there's me. And then after that, we have a lead editor who's also the graphics designer. So he's making all the thumbnails and then he does the editing for our higher level clients or more complicated stuff. Got it. And then next up we have a creative director who's also our copywriter so he on the creative director side he's quality checking all the videos and then he's also giving editors feedback telling them how they can improve and then on the copywriting side he's doing all the content strategy and ideation and then he's doing the video scripts for long form content and short form content so so far we got me lead editor graphics designer and then we got creative director slash copywriter and then next we have a ops manager so what she does is she also kind of acts like a CSM. So she's sending videos to clients. She's middle manning client communication between the clients and the editors. Sometimes there's info that needs to be transmitted. She's also building systems within Airtable, Zapier, Make, and she comes up with ideas for new automations and stuff like that. So she also acts as a project manager. She's right. assigning work to, editor, to editors. So she does a lot of stuff. And then after that, we have a general manager. So the thing, the problem with my ops manager is she only works Monday to Friday, right? Yep. With a lot of my team, they work seven days a week because, you know, they get, they have a choice, right? They don't have to work seven days a week, but they get paid more and then they choose to do so. With my ops manager though, she wants to work Monday to Friday and not weekends. So that's cool. Obviously she has a choice. So then what I had to do is hire someone else to cover for the weekends because stuff would come onto my plate. You know, I'm doing stuff on the weekends. I'm trying to do deep work. I don't want to deal with that. So I got a general manager who does basically all the stuff I said with the ops manager, except now I have more like hands to help. Yeah. And then that's the core team. 
and I'm doing all the marketing sales and I also do higher level content strategy, client onboarding, relationships, et cetera. So that's the core team. And then everyone else after that is literally video editors. So our team is 14 people total. We have around nine or 10 video editors. And we also have like a huge wait list of video editors. So how do you, and maybe some people are watching, they might have, you know, either no editors or no team or maybe a couple. How do you go with the hiring process? How does the hiring process look like for you right now? Yep. So it's different for each role, but for video editors, this is what I want to touch on because a lot of people struggle with hiring video editors. So I get most of my video editors from Twitter. It's by far the best place. I've tried mm-hmm. onlinejobs.ph. I've tried you know, LinkedIn. I've tried Upwork. Twitter, for some reason, just has really good talent. So what I do is I just throw up a tweet. I'm like, hey, hiring for video editors. I put some, some alarm emojis. And then I say, link to apply is below this tweet. So I reply to the tweet with a Google form or an Airtable form, actually. They fill it out. It takes about three minutes. They put their portfolio in there. And then what we do is we look at their portfolio. And then if the portfolio is good, We reach out to them, we add them to a Slack channel, and then we assign them a paid trial, right? Mm -hmm. And then this paid trial, it's either one short form video or like a two minute snippet of a YouTube video. And then they edit the trial. And then if we like it, then we move forwards. And then if we don't like it, we don't move forwards. There's a couple more things like we'll ask them or we'll tell them our budget and then they'll agree to it. We also check, hey, what time zone can they work in? Are they in school? Different Sorry, a couple different things we asked them before we do the paid trial. But yeah, that's how we do it. And then um, right now, in terms of your editors, do you pay them on a, and you don't have to say what you pay them, but like, do you pay them a per video salary? How how is that pay structure? Yep. So the best way that we found to do it is pay per video. And we'd set it up. So we tell them, hey, you're going to get, you know, two videos a week. We're going to pay you this much per video so they can right away calculate how much they make per month. The problem with paying an editor, you know, let's say, you know, 4K a month, right, is Sometimes they tend to slack because they know, oh, you know, I can push back this video to tomorrow. I'm still going to get my 4K. But when I'm paying people per video, you know, they're willing to put in a couple extra hours so that they can fit another video into their week and make more money. But yeah. Do you do the same thing? Uh, Yeah, that's what we've seen because we we do have a couple of people that are on salary. They're just kind of they're more special. Yeah. But yeah, they're more incentivized to work per video. Right. So when we did go from salary to per video, it was literally in terms of percentage, it was like 50 percent more. We were seeing in terms of uh, them completing video which is great right so now we just do per video um, unless it's like a special occasion okay cool how do you and then how do you manage obviously you're doing a bunch of things how do you manage like your personal life with like your business life right now yeah so i don't really have too much of a personal life that's the thing usually when i'm out in montreal it's like i'm pretty much only going out like once per week to downtown and then the other six days i'm just at home but here when i'm traveling you know i was in vancouver i would pretty much just work up until like 3 p.m. Pacific time, which is like 6 p.m. Eastern. And then after that, I'll go outside, go see places, go hang with friends. So kind of just depends what moment of life I'm in or which phase. There's like those grind phases and then there's the times where you kind of pull back a little bit. Got it, fire. So what are are your your short-term goals and your long-term goals for the agency? Yep, so short-term goal for the agency is number one, I'd probably want to hire a CSM and then also a content strategist, like someone who's who already has experience at another agency coming up with ideas, you know, packaging videos, all that type of stuff, and really helping people get the right quality traffic and increase their traffic. So that's kind of short-term goal. And then long-term goal, well, let me think for a sec. I don't really want to say revenue goals, but overall just keep scaling up, get more editors, get more clients. And then also I definitely want to start building out a sales team and like crack paid ads. That's one thing I really want to do in terms of client acquisition. So that's what I'd say agency wise. Got yeah. it. Are you are you doing any other ventures other than the agency right now? Yep. So I do have a coaching program. So I help content agencies above one or two K a month scale up and add 10, 20, 30 K a month to their yep. agency within four months. And I started that on like March 11th. And then we have about 32, 33 students. Fire. Amazing, bro. Congrats. So for you, what's like the biggest bottleneck you've seen most agency owners have right now? Yeah. So since, yeah, and you too, you have a coaching program too. You know, we talk with a ton of these guys. The main problems I see is like, oh, I keep getting undercutted by other people. Or number two, they're they're positioning themselves wrong. They're saying, oh, I'm going to edit your videos. It's like, no, what does a business owner want? They want to make money from their videos. So that's what's, since they're positioning themselves as an editor, they're not able to charge enough and then they get overloaded with work. Or there's other people who just can't land clients. Like if you put a gun to their head, they're still not going to land a client. Like their outreach messages are terrible. Their Instagram is messed up. So I'd say it's really pricing. And then number two would be 
uh, client acquisition. Like they struggle on that end. So, so if someone, you know, so you're saying a lot of people are, you know, saying, Hey, I'm an editor. I'll edit your videos. So what, what should people be saying instead? Yeah. Good question. So instead they should be like, Hey, you know, I see you have like this coaching offer. I can help you get more leads into your program through these YouTube videos, or they can be like, Oh, I see you have a ton of traffic. I can help you convert this Instagram traffic by funneling them into YouTube. Because the good thing about YouTube is it's a conversion mechanism and it's a traffic generation system. So, yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that I say all the time is people aren't just going to pay you for dope videos or or to make cool edits, which, again, maybe it might attract them in the very beginning, but you won't retain them as a client for for very long. Um, So I always say you got to go in there as like, you know, either A, your content strategist that's going to help them develop a content system or plan that's going to generate more leads and sales for their business, right? That's something that someone's like, okay, cool. Yeah. I'll pay top dollar for that. And I'll retain, I'll remain with you for, you know, six, seven, eight months to a year, whatever. Um, okay. Fire. Yeah. To, to add on to that. So like one thing is a lot of these video editors, they know that, that they're supposed to, you know, position themselves in a way where, Hey, we're revenue generating. But the problem is they don't actually know how to generate revenue for people. Like they don't have that skill because they're so button pushy. Like, Hey, I'm a video editor. They don't know, you know, how to come up with ideas, how to script, how to, position your messaging so you're attracting the right quality traffic because when you're working with a b2b business owner they don't need a million views they need literally like 100 or 200 or 300 views but just the right people yep. and then there's you know the b2c coaches people selling biz ops and courses you know they just need more traffic so learning that skill is something that's holding people back all right so let's say bro you had to with everything you know and you had to go back in time to when you first started your agency what would you do now So if I could go back in time, the first thing I would do is just get all the BS boring setup done first. So that's setting up your website, getting your video up on your website, setting up your social media pages, get that done in like three days tops. So that's number one. And then literally day four of starting the agency, you just start your outreach. So the thing is, don't worry about learning the skill because you're going to learn the skill as you're doing the outreach. So I would literally just send out five DMs per day consistently. That's number one. Number two, I would focus on making one YouTube video per week and then two tweets per day. And then I would do one auto DM on Twitter. So what this looks like is, hey, I just made a free guide on how to come up with YouTube video ideas, comment ideas, and I'll send it over to your DMs for free. So doing one of those per week. And then the thing is you can link that Twitter auto DM to the YouTube video. So instead of making two lead magnets, you just made one. So I know that sounded a bit complicated. So to clarify, it's like, you don't need to focus on making different content for each platform. All you need to do is create this pyramid where you have a YouTube video on top and then all the content drips down from your YouTube videos into Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. So I would focus on, to summarize, get the boring stuff out of the way first in 72 hours max, do five DMs per day, and then consistently post content. So that's what I would do. So... And I agree with pretty much everything you said. So for me, one thing though, that I think it's very crucial that a lot of people aren't doing is like building their own personal brand. Yeah. It's like, why would I hire you if you don't even have your own personal brand? You're not even teach, you're not even what you're going to give me or service me. You're not even doing for yourself. Yep. So how do you, how important do you think it is to build your own personal brand? I think it's super, super important that you're, that you're putting in the effort into your personal brand. But one thing is you don't need a million followers as a video agency owner to get clients, but clients just want to see that you're putting in the effort. And then, Hey, if you're getting results for yourself, that's, you know, that's really, really good. You're going to land clients, but you know, you can still land clients even if you have a hundred followers or 200. So when you started your agency, did you have your personal brand already built out? Was it coming up? How was that? Yeah. So I had no personal brand. So I was outreaching on Twitter and I literally didn't even have my face on my Twitter account for some reason. I had some stupid cartoon picture and I still landed a client in 24 days for 6k up front for three months worth of work. And then right after that, I added my face on my Twitter and then I added my face on my YouTube and then that's kind of how everything picked up from there. So to answer your question, I had no personal brand. I had 150 followers on Twitter and a hundred of those were just dead followers from like 10 years ago. Fire, bro. Yep. So then how about you, when you started, did you, were you already like popping a bit or? That um, so when I started, I, 
I think the thing that really worked really well for me is I had good testimonials on my Instagram page. So I had a testimony from like Pace Morby. If you guys don't know him, he's a big, big real estate person. Um, so in the beginning, a lot of the people we were working with was real estate investors. Um, and we still work with a bunch of real estate investors. So I think having that testimonial and I had a couple of videos, um, anybody that would go on our page would see that testimonial, see the videos and be like, wow, this guy's super, super credible. Um, so I think just with kind of that I had, and cause even right now I don't have many posts, but I still have a couple of testimonials, some decent things. But I guess people can still see, um, you know, that I'm, I know what I'm talking about. And then I, for me, what's been key was been stories. Like I think stories really sell. Like stories, I'm very active. Uh, I used to be a lot more active back then when I was like really trying to grow the agency. Um, and the stories for me really, really sold. Are you active on your stories right now? Or I'm pretty active, but I'm a bit on and off. I'm working on the consistency. Okay. But definitely agree, stories are super good for conversions. Like yeah. all these personal brands you see, it's like they get the traffic through their reels and stuff, but then they put a CTA like every day or one day big push per week. So yeah. definitely agree with yeah, you there. Sure. One one question for you is, yeah. so do you think video agency owners need like case studies and social proof before they can start getting paid clients? So what I mean is, do they have to start with free work? Got it. Um, I, I would start with some free work. Yeah, I, I would start with some free work. I don't, I definitely think you can land because we landed clients without any testimonials. You know, we got a lot of clients after testimonies, but we got a lot before without the testimonials. So I think the testimonials definitely do help. I think it shows credibility. Um, so I, I genuinely think that you don't need it to start with, but I would highly, highly recommend getting it as quick as possible so you can scale a lot quicker. Yep, completely yeah. agree. Yeah, one thing is like you definitely need a portfolio. So it's yeah. like, okay, if you have no social proof, people need to see what your videos look like because at the end of the day, we're selling a, a visual service. So okay. people want to see that. So if you're outreaching people and you have no portfolio, it's not going to work. Got yeah. it. Um, so for you, what are, what is, um, and I have it in my mind, I know for me what it is, but for you, what is like uh, a small hidden gem or something small that, you know, no one really talks about, but it like is such a big game changer in like scaling your agency? I think one really big thing is auditing your time. So mm -hmm. I do something every maybe two, three months. I should do it more often. It's called a 72 hour task audit. Mm -hmm. So this free web, there's this free website called Clockify. And then what you do is for three days straight, you track everything you do. You could also do it on a piece of paper, super simple. So you're going to say literally, Hey, 9am wake up 905am washroom, you know, 915 breakfast cooking. And then, Oh, I started work here. I'm doing sales calls. I'm doing et cetera, et cetera. So you're saying exactly what you're doing. And then after the three days, you're going to look at that piece of paper and you're going to see where your time is going. Cause there's a lot of people, and I'm sure you know this, yeah. they think they're working 12 hours a day, but they're really working three hours a day. And the problem with that is the lady working at McDonald's across the street doing eight hour days, she's working more than you, right? So you can't expect to make a lot of money if you're working on the wrong things. I'd say that's the biggest, or I guess, small gem that people should right. pick up on. Well, what would you consider like a high level task? Like what's a high level, what's a high level task for you? And what's a low level task? Yeah. So I think with every business, whether it's a content agency or I don't know, a restaurant, high level tasks are revenue generating. So that's like lead generation, sales calls. And then I guess the hierarchy is like marketing. So just generating more leads. And then after that is converting the leads. And then the lower level task is the fulfillment. And just to clarify, I don't want to sound like weird, like, oh, the fulfillment's the lowest priority. It's just like the fulfillment is, you know, the easiest thing to systemize and put, you know, plug people in, make some systems and that type of thing. Right. But yeah. What do so, you think? Um, well, so I'm gonna go back on the other question about the right. little gem thing. Cause it's like in my yeah. mind now. Um, so one of the things that I think a lot of people, two things actually, that I think a lot of people don't talk about. Um, I think the first thing is you have to be very, one, very obsessed and you have to, you have to look at the small details. So something that I did, um, I think helped me close a lot of people was when I was at my other house that I was living in, that I had my office space, I literally made it basically into like a super dope studio with like my logo in the background, like mm -hmm. an led sign. Um, I had my, you know, the sure mic, I had my camera as like my webcam. Um, you know, and for me, like I would hop on a lot of these calls and they would see that and they'd be like, wow, like my guy who's, who's wants to do content for me, he looks nice. He talks like everything just visually looks nice. Um, so I think like for me, and I don't know, maybe you might think differently, but for me, I think like those small details really help. Cause a lot of those people would be like, I literally ended up working with you because of your setup. Cause it, 
it, it was such a such a good first impression. I saw you put detail into it, um, which made me want to work with you, right? Compared to someone that you hop on a call and they're in, like on a, on a on a shitty webcam, the background is horrible, it's noisy, all that stuff. Compared to somebody that has an you know amazing background, so I think the small details um, is very very key when when doing this business. Um, and then I would say the second thing would be like conviction, like having so much conviction in what you do. So any sales calls, any shoots, pretty much anything I would do, even if I didn't know, you know, I wasn't the best at it. I had so much conviction that I was the best at what I did. That was, there was no questions asked. Right. So on the sales calls, like I would tell them, Hey, this is what we do. And again, I would have, I, I would, you know, not saying that I wouldn't stutter or things like that, but I just had such conviction in what I was saying that they were like, okay, wow, like you, you are the man. Right. So for me, I think the two things is small details, um, and having conviction in like what you do. Right. Yeah. So do you, do you agree with those things? Yeah. So I agree with both of those. And I want to touch on that yeah. first gem. So me, even when I hop on calls to buy stuff, like when someone has a nice camera, nice setup, definitely catches my got my eye. So completely agree with you. Yep. But one thing I want to say is it's definitely not necessary, but it's a, you know, it helps for sure. Cause me, I have my bed in the background now yep. and like, I'm still closing deals. It's like, I have a pretty good camera, but my bed's in the background. It really pisses me off. But at the same time, there's kind of nothing I can do about it just because of the yep. size of my room. So you, if you're in your bedroom for whatever reason, like, don't worry, you don't need to drop 2k on or 3k on camera gear before you start your agency. That's not what he's saying. But you know, once hey, you get some cash flow, get some money, definitely a good thing to invest in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What I, what I would say is, yeah, you don't need it, but once you start getting some money in, make it look as nice as you possibly can. Yeah. Um, even if it's moving things around, putting some lights, whatever. Um, and again, it's not that expensive. And as you scale it, then make it look really nice and things like that. Uh, cause again, for me personally, I think it does, it does help. Um, yeah, for sure. I got one question for you. Go so for I know you're doing shoots in person. So yeah. at my agency, I do no shoots in person like ever. Yeah. So for you, do you think it's worth it? Like if you could go back in time, would you still shoot in person? Uh, a hundred percent. Cause I would say, I would, I don't want to say like, I would say like 85% of clients have stayed with us because we are shooting in person. A lot of clients we do close because we are shooting in person. So at least for us, we deal with a lot of high level individuals that don't have time to shoot their own thing. So it's a whole different dynamic and feel when you're like, hey, we either fly out to you, you can fly out to us, um, wherever the case is, and we'll do the shooting with you. So we'll direct you, we'll keep you accountable. Um, so for us, I think that's what really has made us the difference between, you know, being a low kind of low level agency compared to high level agency is because we include Included the shooting and now we obviously have a nice studio um so for me i would 100 percent keep with the shooting okay makes sense yeah yeah with me one reason why i chose not to do it is one thing i learned so if you guys could take away one thing from this it'd probably be this is keep the business simple so like the more cogs you add into the machine just it becomes like a clusterfuck right so sorry, excuse my language no, no, but you're good. yeah so there's a lot of people who they go like, oh, I need to differentiate myself in the market. And they're like, oh, I'm going to add funnels. I'm going to add paid ads. It's going to go to the organic content and I'm going to do this, this and that. Or you could just copy what's already working, learn how to do it better, maybe add a couple of things, add your own spin to it, and then just scale that up. So definitely keeping things simple, like scales. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the the, the less things going on, the better. Because um, if I always say it is, there's a lot, even with like your, with the agency, if you're doing everything yourself, there's so many things or so many layers that go into it. So the, the less kind of layers that you can make, the easier it is to scale. That's why having like kind of like a dialed in offer. Um, and maybe we can touch a little bit on that. Having like kind of a dialed in offer and saying no to certain things I think is very important. So for you, how, you know, how did you structure your offer? Is it just a set offer? Do you make custom? How does that work? Yeah, so... I'll tell you what I used to do and then what I do now. Yeah. So when I started out, I was selling mainly a short form content offer. And then what I did is I just created something that literally nobody was running. I said, I'll make you 60 short form videos per month using two hours of your time per month. And then this offer crushed. I got to 10K a month in 60 days, 15K a month in 90 days with it or less than 90 days. And the reason why I chose that offer is because, hey, I wasn't promising results. I was being honest with them. It's like, hey, I don't know how good this content's gonna do, but you're gonna have this content. And it was just unique. Nobody was doing it. And then the final value add was I was using barely any of the client's time. So, you know, it made sense both ways. But then I transitioned into promising an ROI. So now what I do with my YouTube offer is I tell them, hey, you're going to get 10 to 30 qualified calls every single month or you don't pay from your YouTube content. But the thing is, is like, I can only give that guarantee to a certain type of person. So about 50% of the people that hop on calls with me, I tell them straight up in the sales call, hey, I'm not gonna get you 10 to 30 qualified calls. Or I tell them straight up, like, I don't even know how many calls I'm gonna get you. But what I can promise you is, you know, I'll make you really good content, make you an authority in your niche. And over time, if you stay consistent, you're gonna start to see results. But I don't tell them exact numbers. 
And then there's the other half of people where it's like, I just look at them and I just, I just know like, Hey, you're going to get results. Here's what you can expect. And then, you know, I give them the guarantee. So hopefully that answers the question, but that's yeah. how I package my stuff right. up. I'm considering moving away from results-based stuff, but yeah, curious on how you package up your stuff. Um, yeah, for the most part, we, we don't really guarantee any kind of result or any ROI. Uh, for us, you know, the only thing we do guarantee is like you will see growth. I just don't know how much growth you're going to see. So I'm like, same thing. I'm very, very honest on the sales call. Um, Cause at least for me, same thing like you is like, unless they're a specific type of person, cause at the end of the day, if they don't have their back end, you know, dialed in and they don't have specific offer, you know, how good are they on camera, things like that. I think that plays into like kind of the ROI. So for us, it's like, Hey, no ROI, but you know, we'll see results or we'll see some sort of results. I just don't know how much. Um, and then for us, our offer is, is mainly kind of very similar where it's ideation, shooting, editing, uh, strategy, and then also social media management. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of the main offer. And then obviously shooting at the studio and stuff like that. And we, we do fly out to people as well. Um, okay, cool. And then for you, how do you differ or how do you know someone's like going to get results compared to someone who's not like, how, how do you, how do you make that difference? Yeah. So there's about two things I look at. So if it's someone who's selling a B2C offer, like, Oh, get started copywriting or get started in high ticket drop shipping. I look at two things like number one, how much traffic do they already have on other social media platforms? Cause I can just funnel that over to YouTube. So that's number one. Number two, I'm looking at, Hey, their story. I'm looking at how they carry themselves, how interesting of a person they are. Cause when you're selling a biz op, you need to be, or if you want to sell a biz op and have success, you need to have a good story and you need to have a personality, like a really strong character. Right? So if we yeah. look at, you know, Andrew Tate, for example, right? He's super like present, you know, he's super, you know, vocal, right? But if you take someone who's like a shy, you know, nerd who doesn't talk much, you know, they're not going to be able to successfully sell a biz op because they don't have a story and they don't have that strong, unique personality. So we look at that for B2C. Another thing we look at is, are they already posting content? You know, how many views are they already getting? How many calls are they already booking? And then we can sort of guess from there what they're going to see working with us. So that's how we do it. Fair. And then for the most part, do you ever decline anybody or do you just like some, Hey, I can't guarantee you or how does that work? Yeah. So we'll, we'll take someone on, but we'll just tell them upfront, Hey, like, I'm not going to give you a guarantee. I don't know what you're going to get, but I definitely do turn people away completely. So I'll tell them like, Hey, you know, you're making, you know, 10, 20 K a month in revenue. Your profit is like five K a month. It's like, I don't want to charge you 3,500 a month. You know, are you even going to be able to put food on your plate? So there's definitely people we disqualify. Um, but if someone really, really, really wants to work with us, like I could always find a, like make a custom package, something lower ticket. Okay. Maybe instead of four YouTube videos, we're going to do just one and then sort of see what happens from there. But always main thing. And it looks like you do the same. Just yeah. always be super transparent on sales calls with these people. I agree. Yeah. Um, here, I got one thing. So Go one thing it. I want to talk about is before the podcast, we we're talking about how big our team size is. So I have yeah. about 14 people in total, but you have 40. And the yeah. thing is, we're doing like around the same revenue numbers. Yeah. So do you want to talk about, you know, how do you feel about having such a big team? And do you think that was the correct sort of way to go? Um yeah, so I think the difference between actually your agency and my agency is that we're, we have kind of two complete different offers. You're more focused on YouTube. We're more focused on short form. So with short form, there is um, a lot more going on. There's a lot more videos to be done. YouTube, you might do a couple, you know, maybe two or three for, for a client or four for a client. For us, we're doing anywhere from... 15 to like 60 for each client, right? So then there might be two editors per client, right? So in terms of that, you know, I knew that I needed to have a bigger team. Um, and then for me, for the most part, um, I believe heavy on culture. I believe heavy. I think, you know, if you're starting a business and that's another, I think, small gem that no, no one talks about is don't treat this as like a transactional type of business with your team. Like I'm heavy on team culture. So we do team calls pretty much every week. I do an admin call every single day with my admin members. Um, literally we just like recently got them like shirt, like shirts for the company. Um, we like, we literally shipped it to like Philippines. Um, it was like super expensive, but like, they're like, Hey, we want to like have shirts and represent. Um, so we're on the team calls. Everyone's like wearing the shirts and things like that. So everyone literally loves to like work here. Um, you know, and it's an environment that's just fun. It, it's, it's, you know, they want to work here. They're getting paid well. So for me, having that big team um, obviously helps in terms of what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to get to. Um, so for me, even having 40, is like I'm, I'm trying to have more, right? I'm trying to get to the point where I'm having 60, 100, um, and then having more in-house people as well in person. But for me, if I had to start all over, I definitely would keep going down the route with having a bigger team just because I know it fulfills for the current offer and what we're trying to head to right now. 
Yeah, makes sense. You made yeah. you made a good point there about you know how long form is like it's pretty different from short form. Yeah. Right. That was one reason I moved away from primarily doing short form content. It's yeah. just like I saw how big the team was gonna need to get. And then another thing is you mentioned, you know, you're doing anywhere from 15 to 60 shorts per month. Like each short is like one piece of content that needs to be quality checked. You know, he's doing like two rounds of revisions on each video. So it's a lot of things can go wrong. So you just need a bigger team for that. So I switched to doing mainly long form content about like five or six months into it, just because, you know, you said yeah. sometimes you need to put two editors on one client. For me, each editor can take on two to three clients. So there's just a lot more, I'm able to run it more lean. And then for one belief I have is for every human you add to an operation gets more complex. So it's like, that's another person you have to manage. And then if that person leaves, you know, it takes 60 days to ramp someone up that's new. Yeah. So yeah. How do you, how do you deal with like, have you had high maintenance clients? Like basically like very naggy or want to revise every video? Like I, I've dealt with that. Yeah. I think that every video agency definitely deals with that type of person at one point. So your question was, how do I deal with that? Yeah. yeah. How do you deal with that? So I'll usually hop on a call with them and I'll, Oh, wait, let me restart. So whenever you get a client, you need to set proper expectations up front. So you can solve a lot of these problems at the start of the relationship. Because if someone, you know, you don't tell them anything, maybe 30 days in, 60 days in, they're going to start putting on a ton of revisions, so on and so forth. And then at that point, you can't impose new rules because they're going to be like, oh, I didn't pay you for this. You know, if I knew this, I wouldn't have paid you. So number one, address everything up front. Say how many rounds of revisions are you allowed to have? You know, what amount of input can you have on the content so on and so forth and then number two let's say i forgot to do that or maybe i did it and then there's still like a pain in the ass what i do is just tell them like hey first i tell them on slack like i'm texting them i'm like hey you know you're not allowed to do this like you should do it like this you know just being super nice and then if needed i'll hop on a call and then if like they're still really annoying really pain in the ass the problem is, is it starts dragging down the team and then the team you know they start associating these negative feelings and emotions with work mm. and then you know you can lose employees and I'd much map sorry I'd much rather lose a client than an employee because with a good employee it's expensive to lose them that's I was just at a mastermind and that was one of the big takeaways I had was you know losing an employee is a really big expense so I'd much rather just turn away the client if I already tried to fix the issues and I wasn't able to fix it yeah that's another good thing is um that you just touch on is Definitely employees are, are key in this business, which again, why you need to have a good culture. You need to pay them all. Like don't, don't pay them cheap. Don't treat them like shit. Um, don't make it transactional. You really treat your employees like everything because again, they will make or break your entire business. Um, and then the other thing you said is like, yeah, the expectations in the beginning. That's why I take onboarding very, very seriously. I feel like you know, I've talked to a couple people, I feel like they don't take onboarding as seriously or set expectations or have like a certain process. For you, do you have a certain like onboarding process, a certain process in the beginning? How does that look like for you? Yeah, definitely have an onboarding process. So how it looks is client pays the contract, pays the invoice, automatically they get added to Slack, they get a Google Drive created, and then they also get added to our Airtable database. And then from there, once they're inside of Slack, they get an onboarding form that they have to fill up. So it takes like 10, 15 minutes. That yeah. gives us all the info we need so we can go and create their content strategy and scripts. And then we have an onboarding call one or two days after they sign and pay the contract. And then in between that gap of time, we're doing the content ideas, doing the research on their competitors, et cetera. Yeah. And then I do all the onboarding calls myself. I hop on with the client, just me and the client, no one else on my team hops on. And then I tell them, hey, here's all the content ideas. I get the green light, cool. And then next, I tell them expectations, stuff like that. I remind them of all the expectations that I already told them on the sales call. And then after that, I just go over, hey, here's how the workflow looks. And I ask them, you know, what days will you be recording and just coordinate a couple of small things. And then from there, smooth sailing. So usually whenever we sign a client, we get their first YouTube video out within nine days. And then after that, just one video every single week. Do you have an appointment setter right now on like your DMs or you're doing all the DM talking, all the outreach, all that stuff yourself? Yeah, so I have a setter, but he's mainly doing it for the coaching program. I haven't trained him for the agency side yet. Got it. So, yeah. Got it. so for right now, for the uh, agency side, it's you doing the DMs, you doing the outreach, rep responding to people, creating all that stuff. Yep. And then taking the sales call. Yep. And then also like making all the YouTube videos, scripting them, you know, making the lead magnets, setting up automations, stuff like that. I think one thing, because you asked me, you know, what are my goals for this year? Yep. So what's your goals? My goals for this year, I think is um, that, and we were talking this before the podcast, 
I have basically a lot of opportunities I can handle right now. I have the agency, I have the coaching program, and then I have the studio. So for me, um, is right now I'm in the process of figuring out what I want to put more time into. I'm really leaning into the coaching, all right? Like going all in on the coaching because pretty much the agency pretty much runs on its own, right? So I'm not technically actively growing uh, the agency right now. I'm not doing a bunch of sales calls. I'm not doing a bunch of that right now because it's at a good spot. Um, so we're at a spot right now where that's pretty much good. So now I think it's really focusing on the coaching program, scaling that. Um, and then the studio pretty much, again, it's pretty much on its own as, uh, as well, but it won't generate me as much money as the coaching. Um, and I, I think it's not as fulfilling. That's the thing for me. I don't know if you've actually dealt with this. I'm curious, but for me, and I've been doing it for a little bit now, I hit a point where yeah, I'm fulfilled, but I don't feel as fulfilled compared to coaching now when I'm coaching students and they're getting results. I feel just a lot better. I feel more fulfilled. Have you dealt with anything like that with feeling fulfillment or feeling happy with the agency compared to coaching, things like that? Yeah. So same exact thing with me. So, you know, agency is still the main focus, but yeah, I would say coaching is more fulfilling because, you know, we've had students, you know, they get crazy results and then they're just so happy when they talk to me. They're like, yo, thank you so much. And I'm like, yeah, bro, I got you. So, cause the thing with coaching and same thing for yourself is you're helping the past version of yourself. So seeing, you know, your old self win, it's like definitely fulfilling. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Have you, have you ever gone or have you ever been through any like sort of burnout or like, you know, times where you're like, I just don't want to do this anymore. Cause I'm pretty sure a lot of people here have dealt with that where, you know, they're struggling X part, XYZ part of their business. Um, and they're just like, Hey, it's just not worth it for me. Have you gone through anything like that? Yeah. 100%. So like, you know, I went through that two weeks after I started my agency, I almost quit. Thank God I didn't. I also went through it like, Hey, six months in. So overall I've probably gone through that like maybe four times since I started this agency a year and a half ago, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. And it's definitely hard to like crawl yourself out of that rut it's like there's upward spirals and then there's downward spirals. So, you know, whenever you're winning, just make sure you keep pushing, you know, work even more, just really keep that up as long as you possibly can. And then, you know, when you're in that downward spiral, like just try and get out of it as fast as possible because you'll get deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah. Another thing is like objects in motion stay in motion. So if yep. you have, the, I believe in momentum, like if you are, crushing it like so for us we pretty much have always you know obviously we've had our downs and we had clients leave and things like that um but we for the most part like it's, it's always been up like the last three years because i've always maintained that momentum i've always gone towards momentum and then again if something bad happens great let's just keep going um you know so even with the studio right like things were going great we had enough money to get a studio so we're like okay cool let's get the studio then once we got the studio kind of like elevated to another level um then once we you know saw that was like doing great we're like hey we'll fly out to clients and that started doing well right so then we just kind of kept that momentum um, and again, same thing. If anything went bad, great. It would hurt a little bit, but we just keep going, right? So just always stay in motion. If you get hit, don't just stay down. Don't don't reminisce too much. Don't think about it too much. Just take act or take massive action, um, and then just keep moving forward. Yeah, right? completely agree. Yeah. One question for you is: Have you ever had people message you or just ask you, like, "Hey, you know, why are you starting a coaching program? Aren't you creating more competition for yourself?" Like, what yeah. what do you think of that? Um, Usually what I tell everybody is that there's so much work and so much abundance out there for all of us that whatever you do won't affect me. Whatever yeah. this person does won't affect me because I, I just think there's there's too much out there, too much demand, especially in the content space. This is something where, you know, and again, I don't know if you agree or disagree, but people say it's saturated or a lot of content agencies. I personally don't think so. I think there's too much demand. I think there is a lot of people trying to do it the wrong way, but if you're doing it the right way, um, you know, creating the proper business, doing the right things, um, methods, all that, I think you can make this into a very successful business. So for me, I think there's just too much out there to consider a competition. Yeah, I agree with you. So what I tell people when they ask me this question, because I get it a lot, is I say there's an oversaturation of bad content agencies. There's tons of them. And then there's only, you know, a handful or a decent amount of ones that are actually good, that know how to reach out to people, that know how to fulfill. So you just need to learn how to not be a bad content agency and then you can succeed. Yeah, for the most part, I would say all the good content agencies kind of know each other. They yeah. know, okay, we know who, who who the big players are. So I would say anybody that's not kind of these big players aren't really doing it well. Um, and again, it goes into like everything we've been talking about this whole podcast, right? How your onboarding process is like, you know, how you get clients, um, your own personal content, you know, pretty much all these small little things, right? This adds up to make, you know, a great content agency compared to all these small, you know, not small people, but people who are trying to do it, um, just doing it the wrong way. So with you, have you ever cracked paid ads like for client acquisition on your agency or is it really just been inbound outbound um funny part is that i i don't think i've ever i didn't i have i didn't crack it for myself first i actually cracked it for my clients so i think doing a lot of 
paid ads. And so that's the thing too. We don't do paid ads for you, but we'll, we'll consult you on how to do it basically. Right. We'll tell you what you need. We'll script the ads. We'll film it for you. We'll edit it and all that, but we won't actually run it. Um, but with consulting with them and seeing how they were doing it and they were getting results, that's how pretty much, or that's how they, they cracked it for themselves with our consulting. And then I basically started doing it for myself and it started to work as well. Yeah. It makes sense. That brings up yeah. a really good point where, you know, if you're a content agency, you don't want to just put yourself in a shell of like, oh, I only do YouTube videos and that's it. You want to be like Chris where it's like, hey, you know, I can consult you on your paid ads or, you know, he also does some long form content stuff as well. So you want to be fluid because at the end of the day, content is content, right? Like long form, short form, you know, there's some differences, but there's a lot of similarities. So with us, like we get recurring clients, but every month, like 10% of our revenue is one off projects, right? So people coming to us like, hey, I need a VSL, you know, boom, 2K, boom, 5K, or like, hey, I need, you know, a pack of ad creatives, boom, another 2K. And everything really adds up. We even take one off projects that are literally like 200 bucks because, you know, that adds up to like two grand, three grand. Yeah. So, you don't want to leave money off the table because if someone wants to buy something, you know, they're, they're going to come to you. And then if you decline them, they're going to go to someone else. So you might as well just sell them because hopefully you're better than the competition. Yeah, just I agree. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, the only time I would say to decline anybody for like a side project, if it's really going to take too much time yeah. or the fulfillment is just going to be at a loss pretty much. I would say that's the only time I would decline. But even last month, uh, I actually closed out a 8K paid in full, actually it was like two weeks ago, but AK paid in full to consult them on how to start their school community. Um, and then we threw in a couple of things, right? We're going to film their, their course material. Um, and then pretty much else, everything is else, it's just consulting, but that's like a side thing that we don't really do, but came to me. He's like, Hey, I see you guys do this. What would you charge? And I'm like, okay, AK, um, we'll consult you on this, do this and this. And he's like, okay, sounds good. And he paid, paid in full. Yeah. That's awesome. And then with those consulting deals, like it's pretty much pure profit. I mean, with that one, you know, yeah. you're filming some stuff. So there's obviously a couple costs there, but yeah, just adding more profit, more profit, like it's definitely a good thing. There's one thing you'll see with a lot of agencies. So not only content agencies, as they scale up, you know, it's a done for you service. You know, you're slowly adding more employees, more software, et cetera, more strike fees, my worst enemy. Yeah. And then what happens is you're going to get to a point where if you're not, you know, keeping an eye on the finances, your profit margin is going to tank. So one, oh yeah, we didn't touch on profit margins. So like, yeah. yeah, I'm doing like around 90K a month with my agency. And then the profit margin has always floated around 60 to 65% net. Like that's after every penny, that's even good. like, you know, slipping in some travel, stuff like that. And sure. on the lowest end, like sometimes it'll go to 55 if I'm really making more investments. So yeah, what has your profit So margin? for us, um, and again, I just have a bigger team. We have, you know, in-person videographers, things like that. So for us, our margins, I would say on a low end, 35 to like 45 yeah is, is, is about the range um so and again doing about the same thing about 90 to, to 100k so hey man you're obviously 19 you're super successful you know you're making a ton of money right now for your age but you still live with your parents why 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 haven't you moved out why haven't you upgraded something better like why, why are you still there yeah good question so one reason why i still live there is because i love my parents and it's like i don't want to rush moving out in a sense of you know I know they still want to stay with me and I'm young. Usually in our culture, like you live with your parents until you're like 24, 26, you know, when you get married, graduate school type of thing. So if I leave at 19, I feel like it's going to leave a small like void in their heart. So that's one reason. Second reason is like I'm keeping the expenses low. So on the personal side, I literally spend sub 500 bucks a month. That's literally just like wow. Ubers and Uber Eats and like gym membership. And then on top of that, I like pitch in for like my family's expenses and stuff. And my brother, he also has a business he pitches in as well. So it just adds up to like 1500 bucks a month, pretty much. Obviously when I'm traveling, you know, there's Airbnb stuff like that. But when I'm at home, which is, you know, 10 months, of the year it's like 1500 bucks a month so i'm really focused on just stacking a ton of money and i'm not cheap right you know just yesterday we dropped like 200 300 bucks each on like a dinner you know which maybe depending on who's watching that's not a lot of money you know <laughs> never know in miami but i or one thing that's important for me is i've seen so many people they run up a ton of money young and then they just start blowing it like they'll they'll split private jets with their friends you know they'll buy crazy shoes crazy stuff and the only crazy thing I bought is like this watch, but like other than that, I've just been just stacking money and I have 50% of my money. How much invested. was that watch? Yeah, it was 11K USD. Was that the biggest purchase you've made so far? Yeah, pretty much. Actually- Or materialistic I, purchase. Yeah, I did. So yeah, this is the biggest one, but I did buy my dad a, a car, but that was less than this. And then like I bought them like phones and stuff. But yeah, I, I like don't really like spend money. So then, you know- if you were to buy something or what's, what's the next like big purchase for you? Yeah. So I think the next big purchase is probably going to be a car or like 
rent at like an apartment or a house but i don't know when that's going to be i really want to like yeah. pull the trigger now but i'm just like delaying the gratification i feel like i haven't earned it yet and i also just want to make sure my first car is like a nice car i used to always say oh yeah my first car is going to be a audi r8 like i don't want to get a honda civic or something like that yeah so but i might switch up i might get like a rs7 instead is yeah. that is that what we're gonna go with rs7 maybe yeah i think so okay got yeah. it do you have any family members or maybe even like cousins who are also in online business or maybe someone you tried to get into it no actually my my whole family is like very old school like even till this day um they're like you got to go to school Mm-hmm. Like I can show them, the, you know, I can show them the, the nice studio, the car, you know, all that stuff. I'm showing what I'm making. They'll say, no, you still got to go to school. So very, very old school. No. Yeah. It makes sense. Me as well. Like, so, or actually, no, that's a lie. So I have my brother, he's like two years older than me. And then he's in online business as well. He started like three months after me. So I have that, but yeah, my parents are definitely super traditional. So, oh yeah. One, one thing yeah. I want to touch on is like, since they're super traditional, like I know a lot of you are probably wondering like, you know, what was you know, your parents' reaction. So I have like Muslim parents, super traditional. My mom is a teacher, my grandpa. So her dad is also a teacher. And then, you know, when I told them I was dropping out, I was at like 5k a month. I was like, okay, I know this is going to work now. I got proof of concept. I can scale this, but school is taking up a ton of my time. So then I told them actually funny enough, they found out because my brother showed them a video like during school hours and I was in the background because I was skipping school. So then they just found out without me telling them. (laughs) And then they were yelling at me for like an hour and I recorded the whole thing. So they just found out they were yelling at me. But what you need to know is like, once you get that proof of concept, like, you know, this is going to work or you really, you know, feel it in your heart that you have that conviction, you know, you just got to, you know, jump the gun and just do it. Just drop out, follow what you want to do. Did, did you ever have um, a moment where your parents just told you not to do it? Or they're like, don't, don't do it. Go to school. Like, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, you know, in that moment when I told them, Hey, I'm dropping out they're like, no, don't do it. You know, they were talking to me for an hour straight, trying to, trying to talk me out of it, but I just went with what I wanted to do. Yeah. So that's another thing too. It's like, for me, I had my mom, I had my dad, I had pretty much everyone telling me go to school. So I dropped out of college four times. <laughs> like I, I knew that college was not for me. I kind of went because of them. You know, if I could go back in time, I would have not even gone, you know, in general um, or period. So for me, if you truly want to do something, like really, really want to do something, don't listen to anybody but yourself, right? If this is something you love and you know you want to get into it, don't listen to your mom, don't listen to your dad, don't listen to anybody, your friends. Because if you do do that, I guarantee you will be, you'll stay broke, right? If your parents are broke or your friends are broke or they're not where you want to be at, you either be broke or be where they're at. So if you don't want to be like that, don't listen to them and listen to what you want to do. Yep. So yeah, so obviously for me, my experience has always been listen to what I, you know, listen to myself and not to any other, you know, people. So for you, have you experienced anything like that with like your parents or your friends or, or you know, with the, you know, friends that you have from school? How's that been? Yeah, so my friends from school, they've always been super supportive and I'm still friends with them to this day. But one piece of advice I tell to anybody who's getting into this is like, don't tell anybody what you're doing. Like, don't tell anybody you're starting an agency, you know, whatever type of business it is, just do it. Don't tell anyone and then keep it to yourself until it starts working. And then you can start telling people or even just try and keep it low key as much as possible. Like for me, I didn't start posting publicly on my Instagram that I even had an agency up until like 60K a month. I started telling my friends like as soon as I started getting a couple clients, but kept it to a tight circle of people. And then one more thing I want to touch on is a lot of people say, you know, oh, you need to cut off your friends, you know, separate yourself from them, that type of thing. I half agree but half disagree so if you have a group of high school friends and i'd love to hear what you think after this if you have a group of high school friends you know they're super dope to hang out with but they're not on that same mission as you don't cut them off still keep in touch still hang out with them but just reduce the volume so like instead of hanging out with them like four times a week just do it once a week or once every two weeks that type of thing and then just you need to just lock in in your own zone and make online friends that do online business. So, you know, out in Montreal, Canada, there's definitely a lot of entrepreneurs, but I knew nobody. So I just made online friends, you know, across the world, Florida, Arizona, LA, all that stuff. And then that was my circle of online people. So you don't need to know people in person. And then you also need to change what you're listening to and the information you take in. So there's two things that influence you a lot. It's like the circle of people you hang around with, hang around with and talk to the most. And then there's the information you consume on a daily basis. So I basically swapped out, you know, all the stuff I would listen to on YouTube for like Andrew Tate or other people that are giving, you know, actual content agency advice or marketing agency advice. 
and that really propelled me forward. So for you, I'm curious, yeah. like, do, are you still friends with your high school friends today? And what do you think of that? So like the crazy part is for me, and this has kind of been my story, is I really didn't even have that many friends when I was in high school. I was always to myself. I've always been that outsider. I was always the one that was just doing completely the opposite things of everybody else. So obviously I had my couple of friends. Um, I don't really talk to anybody. For the most part, I would say all my friends that I have now have been from the same space that I am, you know, that I'm in right now. Um, so I just pretty much hang out with high level individuals at this point, because when I do try to hang out with anybody that's not in this space, um, it kind of brings my energy like low and it kind of puts me mentally in a headspace I was back then. And I, I don't like to be there because I, I just I'm not that person anymore. I don't want to be that person. Um, I want to be kind of this new person who's elevated, who's a lot better, um, who, who's just gone through a lot of development. So for me, I just completely try to cut it off, you know, if I can. Right. Yep. Um, so for, for you, do you, who, like, I guess for you, who do you, who do you hang out with right now? Who do you look up to? Like, do you, do you mainly just hang out now with high level people or do you still hang out with your friends? Like, or do you do a combination of both? Yeah. So for the majority of the year, like I'm, I'm, I live in a whole different province or, you know, my friends are on the West coast from high school and then I live on the East coast now. So I don't see them too often. So for the most part, I'm just hanging out at home with my brother who also does online business. And then like, you know, once a week I'll go downtown, link up with my friend who also does online business. And then I'll maybe have like one or two other friends that I'll see every now and then who don't do online business. Cause I think it's good, you know, sometimes to tap in with and see, you know, what other people are thinking. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And then for you, how, how important has like kind of having like a, not like for your coaching, but like joining other communities and other masterminds, how's that like affected you? It's been super, super helpful because like we were just saying where, you know, I don't, I didn't know anybody in person who was doing this online business stuff. Meeting these people online was a huge help because we would just always bounce back ideas. We would hop on calls and we'd also motivate each other and compete in a friendly way. So with some of my friends, we do a race to 50 K a month and like I'd beat them by like literally two minutes. Cause we're like, so head to head, you know, it's definitely feels really, really good. Um, so you would do competitions with, um, people saying, Hey, whoever reaches 50 K, you know, whatever, win the prize or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fire. So like one of my good friends, who's also my client, Eddie Cumberbatch and his business partner, Brady, you know, we started in the same mastermind, you know, we became friends when we were both doing around 10 K a month. And then it was like, we told each other, okay, like let's race to 50 K a month. And then the loser has to fly out to the other person. And then, so we started at like 10 K a month competing. Fire. And then in September, 2023, so we started the bet like February, uh, 2023, both doing like 10k a month and then september 2023 like i literally beat them to 50k a month by like five minutes it was like insane wow. so we're like super super head to head Did that invoice just come in five minutes before they're yeah got paid? Like wow. literally five minutes and then what's funny though is like they're they got two business partners and then it's just me so but yeah that friendly competition aspect is just super super important That's so fine. yeah for you like how has online communities affected you it's been huge, bro. For me, like entrepreneurship, especially at a high level, is very lonely, right? Like, you know, you see the glamour, you see all the crazy stuff, especially in Miami, right? You're, you see the yachts, you see the dinners, you see all that, but like 95% of it is not that. 95% of it is alone on a computer, alone by yourself, thinking, doing, you know, all these high level tasks, things like that, right? So for me, it's it's a good gateway to like see what other people are doing. And then also like you you struggle with a lot of things in this business where you think it's just you, yep. right? You just think it's you. It's like, ah, oh, no one's going through this. It's just me. Then when you talk to other people in these other communities or masterminds, you're like, oh shit, you're dealing with the same shit I'm dealing. Oh, okay. I, I don't feel as bad. Right. And then you can, you know, obviously collaborate and help each other out. Like, Hey, I'm, I'm trying this, I'm trying that. Um, and you start to meet other people and then you can just get feedback, talk to them. Um, and you can solve a lot of your issues by just talking to people in that community. So it's, it's been, it's been pretty much extremely helpful bro, in our, in my growth. Yep. hundred yeah. percent. One thing I really like is when I meet up with other high level content agency guys like yourself, you know, we're doing around the same revenue. Yeah. And I was just at a mastermind with Eddie Malouf, Ashton Shanks. They have a group called agency founders. And then there's a couple other content agencies there who are doing around the same revenue as us. And like, we're all like sharing tactics, strategies, et cetera. Like we don't gatekeep, right? Cause going back to what you talked about earlier, just, we all have that abundance mindset. We know there's enough clients for everyone. Like everybody can eat. So yeah. yeah. I agree. Who, who are some people, and obviously you said Adam, uh, Eddie Malouf, um, who are some top people that you kind of look up to right now in the agency space or, you know, in the 
content agency space? Yeah. So I guess in the agency space overall, definitely like Eddie Malouf, Ashton Shanks, you know, they're pulling in big numbers. And then in the content agency space, to be honest, I don't look up to anyone. I like see everyone like, you know, eye to eye, I guess. Yeah. Like definitely, you know, there's you, there's like, you know, there's Ryan McGinn, there's, let's see, there's one guy I met, his name is Omar. There's these two guys, they're actually doing like more money than both of us. Like they're doing mm -hmm. 140K a month. I just met them at the event. Right. So now I got this, like, I got a couple contacts in my phone who do the same business as me. So definitely right, cool. right. So to kind of wrap it up, um, and I like to end it with like tangible kind of steps, right? So what are kind of three things right now that someone can improve in their agency or in their content agency to pretty much like change it for them? What, what is like kind of three tangible things they can do right now? Yep. I think the number one, okay, so first thing, you know, this maybe applies if you're already over 10K a month, is just get a video quality checker. Because I don't know about you, but quality checking videos is one of the most time consuming tasks. So just getting that person in is going to give you back so much time that you can go reinvest into other parts of the business, drive more revenue. So that's like key, key piece, number one. Number two, definitely do a 72 hour task audit. So track, you know, what are you doing for three days straight every single minute of the day? And that's going to be a huge game changer and then you'll be able to allocate your time. And then the final piece I would say is just have that abundance mindset and conviction. And I'll throw in one bonus that's actually like tangible is like do Dream 100 outreach. So this is five DMs per day with free work up front. By far has been like the highest converting type of cold DM that we've ever done at our agency. We've tried copy paste, we've tried personalized, but no uh, free asset. And we've tried with the free asset up front. It crushes every single time. So I'd definitely implement that. Fire. Yeah. So my, my three takeaways would be definitely have conviction in everything you do, right? Just have confidence. Even if you don't know what you're doing, a lot of times if you just have conviction and confidence, you'll end up closing the deal or figuring it out as you go. Um, the second one is converting your mindset from a just a freelancer or a videographer into an actual like CEO. So like hire team members, um, hire staff, hire, you know, editors, stuff like that. So you're not doing everything yourselves. And then third would be to, yeah, make community, join masterminds, make that investment in those things. Cause again, they're going to help you a lot further along the line because you can talk to people that are in your same levels. You can see the same struggles um, and things like that. So I think those are my three biggest takeaways. So bro, I appreciate you for being on the podcast. It's been absolutely amazing, bro. And I can't wait to, you know, we should actually do this again. We should probably do some sort of competition for like six months from now to see who can reach like a certain goal. Um, actually, let's do this. Why don't we just do it now on the podcast? Okay. Um, let's, let's do a goal. Um, so again, we're both around the same range. You said you want to hit how much by the end of the year? Yeah. So 200 K a month with the agency by end of year. Okay. So let's do that. Let's do whoever can hit 200 K a month first. Um, so, so the, yeah, the goal would be hit 200K a month by the end of the year for both of us. Um, and then if we lose, what would you want to do if we lose? If we lose? So if you lose, um, you fly out to, to Miami and we do another podcast and then we see exactly what you did to basically strive to hit it. And then same thing, if I lose, I'll, I'll go out there and we'll do another podcast out there. Okay, sounds good. Sounds Let's good, do bro. It. Let's get cool. it. Cool. Dope. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate and you, brother. Yeah, we'll, we'll so, see who wins. So guys, I'll see you guys in the next episode, you know, possibly in the next six months. We're going to do a competition and who would hit uh, 200K within the next six months. So we'll see you guys on that episode. Peace.